Hey you guys, and welcome to my old slash new channel. So as I told you guys, I was gonna start a true crime channel cause I'm definitely into true crime. I've been into true crime for years and a lot of people have also been asking me to start my own true crime channel. So that's what I'm gonna do with my old lovely news channel. So welcome, welcome, welcome new and old subscribers. So the case that we're gonna be talking about today comes from my state of Minnesota. And it is about the Jacob Weatherling case. And if you guys have been on my news channel for any length of time, I'm sure you guys remember when I covered the case a few years ago when his killer finally admitted to killing Jacob and he was finally brought to justice. This took 27 years. And a lot of people don't know the backstory and how Jacob Weatherling, as an 11 year old child, basically changed the trajectory of missing children's cases. And it was because of his case that we now have the National Sex Offender Registry list. And that registry is for people, you know, who have committed crimes against children. Back in the day, there was nothing. They would just get out of jail and they would keep, you know, molesting and, you know, doing things to kids. Because of what happened to Jacob Weatherling, back in 1994, they decided to enact this in Jacob's name. Where now, um, if you've done anything, any type of sexual assault, especially towards children, you will be labeled as a registered sex offender. You have to let the people that you're staying with know, the apartment complex. You also have to be in touch with like, you know, the jails, the schools. They have to know that there's a sex offender within that area. And if you are a sex offender, you cannot live around a school. You can't be around parks. So this this registry has helped a lot of people. It saved a lot of lives. There has been some controversy about the sex offender registry over the past few years, but child, that's a whole nother video. So I want to talk to you guys about this case because it's a case that I hold very dear to my heart and it basically changed my childhood. So if you guys do not know, I grew up in Richfield, Minnesota as a kid. I was like in elementary school at the time. Jacob Weatherling, he grew up in a little town in Minnesota called St. Joseph. And as kids in Minnesota, we would have never thought something like this would happen. We would have never thought that we would never be able to see our parents again. This case hit national news and it scared a lot of us and it really shattered our childhood innocence. Welcome to True Crime Tea Time. I hope you guys enjoy this video. And if you're into true crime, make sure you subscribe to this channel. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. If you want it, then come to me. Discuss the crimes and the unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time. dark history. Jacob Weatherling was born February 17th, 1978 to Patty and Jerry Weatherling in St. Joseph, Minnesota. He had three other siblings. Amy was the oldest. Jacob also had younger brothers, Trevor, and he had a sister named Cameron, who was the youngest of all of the kids. The area in which the Weatherlings' home was in, it was situated on a gravel road. Along the roads were a lot of bushes and shrubbery and things like that. There was also a lot of ditches and fields in that area. It was really, really rural, really, really far out. Nonetheless, all of the kids were happy. They often enjoyed fishing with their father and just spending time with their mother. The entire family was basically filled with love and happiness. So what happened is that back on October 22nd, 1989, Patty and Jerry Weatherling, they decided to go out to dinner with some friends. They left the house around 5.30 p.m. and they didn't intend to stay at the dinner that long. So they decided not to take the kids with them. And so basically the oldest daughter, Amy, she wanted to go to her friend's house. And so she asked her parents, could she go? And they told her, you know, yes, that's fine. Jacob was also given permission to have a few of his friends come over as well. And so his friends were Trevor and Aaron, and they were supposed to be babysitting the little sister, Cameron. So before leaving, the parents gave the kids the phone number in order to reach them in case something happened. So then what ended up happening is after the parents had been gone for a while, the kids started getting antsy. They were having fun, but you know, like kids do, they want to go explore. They want to leave the house. So after being alone for some time, the kids all wanted to run a movie. And back in the day, this is one of the things we did as kids. We didn't have streaming services. You had to physically go to Tom Thumb or go to Blockbuster and you had to go rent a movie. So Jacob called his mom and he asked could they take their bikes down to Tom Thumb and go rent a movie because they wanted to watch a movie. 
And Jacob's mom said, no, she was like, it's getting dark out. Um, I don't feel good about this. You cannot go out right now. It's way too late. So unfortunately, like kids sometimes do, they'll ask one parent one thing. And if one parent says no, they'll go and ask another parent. I've been guilty of this as well as a child. So after Patty said no, Trevor and Jacob then decided to ask their dad. So they got the dad on the phone instead. And he had no idea that Patty had already told the boys no. So he said, okay, fine. You guys can go but make sure you guys put on some light reflective vest because again, they lived in a really rural area. There was not a lot of light. And so those um, reflective vests helped for oncoming cars to see them so that way they wouldn't get hit. And he also told them to take a flashlight with them as well. The sad part is little did they know when they left the house that day that that vest would help to identify Jacob years later. As they were leaving, they decided to drop Cameron, the little sister, off at one of their friend's house who lived a few houses down. And she said that she would watch Cameron for them. So the boys basically went off to Tom Thumb. All they had on were these reflective jackets and they had flashlights. That's the only thing they had on them, plus the money to go rent the movie. So Jacob's jacket that he had on, um, the reflective part said police department on it but nobody knew how much deeper this case was gonna get that he would eventually need the police department to get involved. So what ended up happening is every parent's nightmare. The boys were coming back from the store around nine and it was early winter, so it gotten really dark quite early. Their only source of light was the flashlights that were hanging around their necks. And the boys had covered most of this trek. They were almost home. And just about three to four minutes from their house, all of a sudden a tall masked man jumped in front of all three boys. And he just came out of the darkness, just in some type of path. And so the man ordered all three boys on the ground. He was like, throw your bicycles in the ditch right now and you guys stand here in front of me. These are babies. These kids are literally between the ages of 10 and 11. So they're scared, they're doing what they're told. Plus the man is pointing a gun at them. So because these boys are scared, they followed his every command. So as he got closer to the boys, he looked at their faces and he proceeded to ask each boy, how old are you? So each boy was so nervous. Trevor was the first one to respond. He says, I'm 10. So he tells Trevor, you need to run right now. Run away from here and do not look back. So, you know, Trevor, he just ran. He ran as fast as he could because he was told if he looked back, he would catch a bullet to the back of his head. So Trevor's running. Then he looks at the other two boys. He asks his Aaron his age and Aaron is trembling now. And he's saying, I'm 11 years old. So he tells Aaron the same thing. You need to run as fast as you can, get away from here, and if you look back, I'm gonna shoot you. So now, the only child that's left is Jacob. So by now, Jacob is like terrified because his two friends are gone, they've ran off, and now he's left with this complete stranger. So after a while, Trevor and Aaron caught up to each other. They're shaking, they're nervous. They're trying to look back and basically grab a glimpse of this guy, but they also don't want to be shot. So they're now like just running. They'd want to go to an adult's house. They want to go get some help. They're just running. And as they look back one last time, neither Jacob or the man are there. Trevor and Aaron, they rush home and they go to the babysitter's house who's watching Cameron, Jacob's little sister, and they tell her everything that happen so at that point they decide to call Jacob's mom and dad even the girl who was watching them her name was Marilyn she called her parents as well so while Patty and Jerry were enjoying dinner with their friends they get this phone call from Marilyn and they're saying you know you need to come right now something has happened Jacob has been taken, we've called 911. They all called 911 to let them know of the kidnapping. Soon cops arrived at the Weatherling house and interviewed the witnesses, Trevor and Aaron. Surprisingly, police did not believe the boys. They suspected that the two boys, while playing with the gun, had accidentally shot Jacob and were creating this whole drama just to cover up their mistake, which to me is just insane. Where would these two little boys get guns from on their way to the convenience store, but whatever. So with the insistence of the parents, they're like, look, it's 1045 at night. Jacob has never been out this late. He's only 11 years old. We don't have any guns in the house. We need you to go search for him. This is not what you guys are thinking. So finally they start getting dogs out. They get firefighters and even helicopters. They start patrolling the area from the skies. They're patrolling the area from the ground and they're trying to find Jacob. Now, the morning of October 23rd, the police discovered tracks and footprints near the gravel driveway where Jacob was last seen. 
These marks were not helpful in the investigation, though, because, first of all, the police were not certain whether the marks were made by the kidnapper or somebody else. And secondly, who knows how many people have walked down that same road and how many cars have driven down that same road, you know, over the past few hours. So they really couldn't take it that seriously. And most importantly, they really couldn't match the tracks or shoe prints to anything using science. Cause remember this is 1989. There was no real significant science back then to do all of the stuff that we have now. So these difficult questions put the investigators in a very difficult position. They really didn't have any hard evidence to go on, but there was a local man in the area that they, you know, they kind of suspected him. You know, he's kind of weird. He was kind of off. His name was Dan Razier and he was a neighbor of the Wetterling family. On the night of the abduction, he saw the car coming up his driveway and then taking a turn to go up the hill. And he said the car was doing between 60 and 70 miles per hour. And this was around 10.45 p.m. Smokey, his dog, started barking. And when Dan went to go check the window to find out what was going on, he saw a lot of people kind of moving about the property with flashlights and he thought they were thieves. So Dan ended up calling 911. But however, the dispatcher informed him that the people were part of the search team looking for a child who had been abducted. Then Dan went outside to talk to the deputy officer who told him about the car he had seen earlier. The officer found Dan, you know, his demeanor kind of suspicious, you know, kind of antsy. And so he kind of raised red flags. He expected him to show way more concern for this abducted young boy who lived in his neighborhood, but Dan really didn't care one way or another. So that kind of felt odd to the police that he was just so nonchalant about it. So the next day, the police went to Dan's workplace to question him. And on top of that, they also took tires of Dan's vehicle to compare them to the tire tracks that were found near the abduction site, but no matches could be made. And one week later, they searched Dan's home and they found nothing. Dan was also given a lie detector test and he was also given a statement under hypnotism to prove that he was innocent. And when nothing turned up, the police finally ruled him out as a suspect. With no success after thoroughly investigating Dan, the police continued the search and the case grabbed the attention of many people. While the search was on, Jacob's parents made every possible effort to let the world know about their missing child. Thousands of people came forward to support them in their tiny town. Not only this, but many FBI psychologists, experts, people who are in the field, they also were trying to build a profile of this potential kidnapper so that way they could put very specific details out there about this criminal. Now, according to the FBI, they stated that he's a white loner. He has a physical deformity. He was somebody who has committed a crime like this before. Now, even though Jacob was from this really small town, his story was huge. And it finally reached the Twin Cities where I was living as a young girl. And this was all over St. Paul, Minneapolis, the suburbs. This story was everywhere. And they constantly were holding, you know, candlelight vigils for Jacob. Um, they had a big one on October 25th where over 500 people attended. Even the city of St. Paul, Minneapolis, they put up a $100,000 reward to whoever the killer was. They were just trying to figure out what was going on, where was Jacob. You know, he was a child from the state of Minnesota, so the capital cities were going to do anything to try and get him back. While so many people mourned with the victim's family, what the family honestly feared the most, according to them, is it was high likely that the kidnapper sexually abused Jacob. And he did not stop there. He might have even killed him. The poor boy, by November 1st, almost a million flyers with Jacob's photo had been circulated all around the country. The search team spanned a 700 square mile area looking for Jacob. In the first few weeks of November, the police made sketches of many men who seemed to be likely suspects. One sketch was a man who was seen that fateful night at the convenience store where the boys went to. His suspicious behavior of fiercely staring at customers was alarming many that were present there. This ended up with him being in the police sketch. Two other sketches of two other suspicious men were also released as well, but to no luck. For days, the police could not make any progress in this case. It seemed as if they were under a spell or a curse that pushed them to every dead end possibly imaginable. Every time they found a lead, every time they found a clue, a little ray of hope, it constantly ended in a dead end. It was not until December that the police made considerable advancements in the case. During this time, the FBI got a chance to interview Jared Shirell. 
He was a 13-year-old boy who had experienced an ordeal similar to Jacob. Sadly, Jared was assaulted on January 13, 1989. This was nine months prior to Jacob Weatherly's abduction. Jared told the FBI of his experience on that fateful day. He said he was walking home from the skating rink after dark and a car pulled up on him. The driver, a male, asked him for directions to a particular place. While Jared was giving him directions, the man just suddenly grabbed him. He grabbed him and he pulled him and he shoved him into the car. The man threatened Jared, telling him that he had a gun and that if he didn't do what he told him to do, he would kill him. He said, if you try anything sketchy, I won't hesitate to use this gun on you. So by then, 13-year-old Jared, he's scared. You know, he's frightened right now because he was not expecting this. The man then took Jared to an isolated area where he sexually assaulted him. After brutally exploiting the boy, the man took Jared back to Jared's hometown in his car. Then he ordered Jared to run away, to not look back. If not, he would shoot him in the back of the head. So that automatically rang alarm bells to the FBI and to the police that were investigating this case. Because remember, that's what the abductor told Jacob, Trevor, and Aaron as well. So the police were stunned hearing Jacob's account. You know, the whole don't look back or I'll shoot you. Those words were the same words. So it did not take a genius to conclude that these two incidences had to be related. According to Jared, the man had a raspy voice. That was not the only thing that Jared knew about him. He also knew his face. Jared said he would remember his face because his rapist, when he abducted and molested him, did not wear a mask. So Jared describes this feeling after knowing that his testimony was the strongest clue to solve in the case. The police started to interview Jared to get even the smallest details of the abductor. Although revisiting these memories were probably very traumatizing to him, but for little Jared, he just wanted to do anything to try and help, you know, bring back Jacob Weatherland and bring his family some type of peace. So he was willing to contribute any information to help bring this monstrous man to justice, which is a huge responsibility to lay on a 13 year old. So Jared helped the police release a sketch of the abductor. And with the sketch, the police carried on the investigation, highlighting many men and many people of interest. And one of those men was a man named Danny Henrich. He was a resident of Painesville, Minnesota. And on December 16th, the cops interviewed Danny. He denied having anything to do with Jacob or Jared. However, the police, once again, his attitude was just very weird. And so it raised suspicion about him. So they talked to the Painesville police chief and they wanted to get more information on this guy. Police chief said that he had been experienced with this guy named Danny and that he was known for assaulting young boys, but they didn't have evidence, but the chief had always believed that Danny was the suspect because there was a lot of whispers in that small town. So on January 12th, 1990, the police once again questioned Danny and he gave hair samples and handed over his shoes for some type of comparison to that gravel print that they had found the night that Jacob was abducted. So on January 15th, the police took the rear tires of Danny's car and the police compared the tire marks and the shoe prints found at the site of the abduction. And there was a general match, but it wasn't a solid match. You know, it's it was one of those general tires that anybody could have had. It wasn't anything specific enough. They needed something backed by scientific, you know, concrete evidence. And at that point, DNA was starting to become a thing, but it was not relatively available and it would take a long time to get back the analysis but they kept the hairs for further you know, investigation down the line. So on January 16th, the police relied once again on Jared. They made Jared basically sit in Danny's car because he was still basically the same height as he was a few months ago. And they wanted him to get a feel and you know, think back to when he was abducted. Was this the car that you were in? Does this feel the same? So I'm sure it's very traumatizing for Jared that he was put through that, but he really did his best to try and help this case. And so on a scale of one to 10, Jared said that the car was an eight or nine. He couldn't definitely say that it was a 10, but he said it was about an eight or a nine and that it was a very similar car to the one that had kidnapped him that day six months ago. So the police felt like, you know what, this is great progress, but we still need more solid evidence. The suspect nearly escaped on January 24th. The police searched the house where Danny was living with his parents. And while there, the police were going through all his stuff. He claimed that he was home the night of Jacob's abduction, but the police found scanners and two very disturbing photos. 
One was of a young boy wearing underwear, and the other was also of a young boy with a towel wrapped around. So why did he have these pictures with him? A normal person does not keep such things in their possession, especially if they're not into, you know what I'm saying, child pornography, molestation, and things like that. So the police decided to confiscate his pictures, and they were asking Danny, what is going on with these pictures? Why do you have these pictures? Who are these young boys? And Danny at that point was going off. Um, he was saying it's unfair. You know, those are his possessions. They had no business touching his stuff. It's nobody's business. They're over the age of 18. And then he even promised the police that he would burn the pictures. So after that, they just didn't trust Danny. And on January 26th, they told him that they wanted him to come and be in a lineup. So they also called Jared down there. And Jared went to the police lineup. And they had six men stand in the lineup. And Jared was looking at all six men really, really closely. But unfortunately, Jared was not able to identify Danny. Danny was one of the men standing right in front of him, but he just couldn't pick him out in the lineup, unfortunately. Well, the police thought, well, maybe Jared is scared. Cause again, remember this is a 13 year old kid. You know, maybe he didn't pick him out out of fear or maybe he, you know, he forgot or maybe he just really never saw the perpetrator's face. It could have been a, a merit of things, but either way, once again, Danny gets off. Now, even though Jared failed to identify the criminal, that did not stop the police. On February 9th, some substantial forensic evidence piled up against Danny. The FBI reported that fibers found on Jared's clothing were similar to fibers obtained from the seat of Danny's car. The same day, Danny was arrested for Jared's kidnapping and assault. Unfortunately, even this forensic evidence was not strong enough to charge Danny and he was released. So now we fast forward to February 17th, 1990. It's been almost four months since the heartbreaking incident that happened to the Weatherling family. And so far there's no signs of closure. They still haven't found Jacob. It's now officially his 12th birthday. Over 200 people gathered to remember him. And after that, the case literally just started turning cold. We didn't hear too much after 1990. Now on April 13th, 1990, the FBI put forward another piece of evidence. They reported similarities between the shoe print at the scene and Danny's right shoe print. But that too was rejected for not being, you know, a convincing enough evidence because they felt like anybody could have that same shoe. You can't just blame it on Danny. A year had passed and a crowd of a thousand people gathered to mark the one year anniversary of this painful event concerning Jacob Weatherling's abduction. The family had longed for justice, but after a year, no justice was found. Years passed and the world would never forget Jacob Weatherling. The police had had their motivation shattered after each rejected evidence, but they never lost the courage to try again one more time in hopes that Jacob might still be alive. A computer enhanced photo of what he might look like at the age of 19 was released across the U.S. in 1997. He would have graduated from high school in 1996. I remember in Minnesota, they did a huge celebration for him for his high school graduation. It was all over the news. It was like the 10 or 15 year anniversary of his abduction. And, you know, people really celebrated his classmates that were in the class with him when he was back in the sixth grade. They were also saying a lot of things on the news their senior year. So Minnesota never forgot Jacob Weatherling. So after this, many years passed and we didn't hear too much else about Jacob. Um, but it seemed like their wish for closure was eventually going to be fulfilled. Now, back in 2003, a man named Kevin told the police that the night of the crime, he heard about the abduction on a police scanner and actually drove near the site of the abduction just to check it out. When the police received this information, the puzzle pieces started to come together. If Kevin did indeed drive near the site, then that explains why the tire marks were there near the site and also the car seen by Dan through his window. This led the police to start looking at the abduction from a different angle. All along, the investigators thought that a vehicle was involved in the crime, but this new information means that the abductor was actually on foot. And the abduction could only be possible if the abductor lived near the abduction site. Once again, all the clues pointed to Dan Rassier, the neighbor of Jacob Weatherling. In 2004, the police once again for years have tried to find evidence that pointed towards Dan, but they found nothing important. Still, they made his life a nightmare. 
by spreading his face all over the media, labeling him as a sole person of interest responsible for Jacob's disappearance. On the 1st of July, 2010, the police searched his house in St. Joseph, and once again, they dug through his property, hoping to find some human remains, but nothing turned up. His face was spread all over the news. Everyone he knew, everywhere he went, he was treated as a criminal. If that wasn't bad enough, the concept of innocent until proven guilty had been lost on Dan. It was as if the police were tired of keeping the case unsolved and just wanted to put the blame on somebody else to get it over with, even if the person being blamed was innocent. Jared Sherrill, who has still been keen on finding out who abducted and molested him, had moved to Painesville. He had never forgotten about his abduction after all of these years. So now he's no longer the 13 year old boy, he's a grown man. After moving, he heard about a series of sexual assaults on young boys between the years of 1987 to 1989. His sixth cent kept telling him that there was a connection to all of this. He reached out to all of the boys who are now grown men to have them tell him their account of what happened. It was not surprising to Jared that all the individuals had similar experiences with their molesters. Jared reached out to the police with this information. He also told them that it was highly likely that the man who had abducted them was also responsible for Jacob's disappearance. Now, listen to this twist of fate. The night that Jared was abducted and molested, um, basically he was wearing a sweater. He was wearing a sweater that day and for whatever reason, Jared never washed it. He just kept it after all these years. He left it in like a bag or something, threw it in the back of his closet and just did not want to think about it anymore. Thankfully for him, he never washed that sweater because that sweater ended up having DNA evidence on it. And they were able to run it through the DNA database, which by now was way more advanced than back in 1989. And the DNA came back a positive match. Like after all these years, a positive match. And guess whose DNA was on that sweater? The neighbor in Painesville. Danny Hurwich, the one who had the two pictures of the young men in his basement, that Danny. The other Danny who was Jacob's neighbor, he was innocent, he had nothing to do with it. But after 27 years, DNA evidence confirmed that this Danny did have something to do with it. And there was solid DNA evidence as well. Not only could they link Danny to Jared's assault, but they could possibly even link him to Jacobs as well. Once again, they hit another stumbling block in this case. This case has so many twists and turns, it's really heartbreaking. Because of the statute of limitations, the whole situation against Danny Hyrich, it had expired. So Jared was not able to get any type of justice for you know Danny molesting him because it had been 27 years. So he was not able to hold him accountable because of the statute of limitations. So because of this, he could not take Danny to court. So now fast forward to July 28th, the day before my birthday, honey, the police were able to get a search warrant to go through Danny's home. And it was very obvious that Danny was indeed the offender. They found duct tape, handcuffs, child pornography. They found bins of athletic wear containing boys' underwear, undershorts, undergarments. They found videotapes of young boys doing normal daily activities like riding bikes, playing soccer. Now the police had legal reason to arrest him. They arrested him with 25 counts of possession of child pornography. He was set on trial and the investigations were certain that Danny was also behind Jacob's abduction. When they confronted him about it, Danny tried to bargain with the police. Three weeks before his trial, his plea bargain began, and he said that if he admitted to involvement in Jacob's abduction and revealed everything that happened that fateful night, he would lead police to Jacob's remains, and he would not be charged for the murder. Jacob's family was given the authority to decide whether or not the police should take this bargain. Faced with such a dilemma, Jacob's family just wanted the long, overdue answers to what happened to their son because they felt like Danny would be punished for the child pornography. You know, if he does wanna be coined a murderer, that's fine. We just wanna know where our Jacob is after 27 years. So finally they agreed to accept the plea bargain because they just wanted closure. When they found out what happened to their son, it was heartbreaking, but at least finally they were able to lay their baby to rest. The truth finally comes to light on September 1st, 2016. Danny Heinrich led the police to Jacob's remains. He had been buried near pasture 
near Painesville, not far from Danny's home. When they reached the site, a small part of Jacob's reflective vest was peeking out of the soil. If you remember, that was the advice that Trevor's dad gave them. He told them all to put on their reflective vest. And there he was, that piece of material, the reflective vest, after all these years, the reflection was just shining, the sun hit it, and it was just amazing because it's almost like Jacob was saying, here I am, here I am. It just like you could not take your eyes off this reflector that just kept getting hit by the sun. So when Jacob's remains were found, everyone in Minnesota, in that town, they turned on their porch lights in solidarity to show support to the victim's family. Danny revealed what happened the night that he abducted Jacob. Danny stated that he was driving around St. Joseph without anything on his mind. That's when he saw three boys riding their bicycles with flashlights on. He then got out of his car and approached the kids. He spared the two boys and chose Jacob as his victim. He handcuffed them, put them in the car, and drove to Painesville. According to Danny, throughout the ride, Jacob was crying and kept asking him, what did I do wrong, over and over. He just kept asking, what did he do wrong? Danny drove to the gravel pit in Painesville where he sexually assaulted Jacob after being subjected to the worst violence imaginable. Poor Jacob innocently told him that he was cold and he just wanted to go home. He begged him, can you just please take me home? After a while, Danny saw patrol cars in the area and it started to freak him out. And at that point, he's scared that, you know, they might be looking for his car. They might be looking for Jacob. So Danny pulled out his gun and pulled the trigger. But guess what? Nothing happened. No bullet came out. It's almost as if divine intervention was giving Danny one more chance to rethink what he was about to do. So the bullet jammed. Danny goes to take a look. He fixes it. He turns it in the chamber. And once again, he puts the gun to Jacob's head and he just blows the little boy's head off, killing him instantly. Danny then took Jacob's body and he buried him in a gravel pit. But one year later, he decided to move the body into a pasture. And that pasture is where Jacob has laid in, in this grave in the ground for the past 27 years. So that is what happened to Jacob Weatherling. The whole situation is just really, really sad, extremely disturbing as well. In the Jacob case, justice wasn't technically served, but in a way it was. Danny Henrich was convicted of one count of possessing child pornography, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He was neither convicted or charged with Jacob's murder and the abduction of all the young boys in that area because of this plea deal, but he was still able to get 20 years because of the child pornography charge, which to me is just great that he still got some type of punishment. The family of the victim for 27 years, Jacob's parents lit a candle every year on his birthday in hopes that he would still be alive somewhere and they wanted to make sure that he was never forgotten. Jacob's family turned their porch light on every single night after the incident because for them, Jacob was still out there and the light would help him find his way back home. For 27 years, the Weatherling family did not just sit back and wait for progress in the investigation. They made sure that Jacob's death was not in vain. And in January 16, 1990, they honored him by establishing the Jacob Weatherling Foundation, now known as the Jacob Weatherling Resource Center. The center works with the aims of preventing and ending all forms of child abuse, abduction, and exportation. On September 13, 1994, the U.S. Congress passed the Jacob Weatherling Crimes Against Children and Sexually Violent Offender Registration Act. And this is also known as the Child Safety Act, where the law aims to keep an eye on criminals convicted of sexual offenses against minors after their release. Now, as far as the other Danny, the neighbor that lived next to Jacob, he was very upset, especially being that, you know, the other Danny that they were looking at, they found two boys' pictures in his home. You know, and at that point, why would they not look at him as a pedophile and at least charge him? But I think the laws were so different back in the 80s that they just didn't look at it as pedophilia. But it's really sad that Dan Reiser, his life was basically ruined. He was an innocent man, but for decades, he was accused of being Jacob Weatherling's kidnapper and abductor. 
And so his private life, his work life, everything was severely affected. People looked at him as he was some type of abductor, some type of kidnapper. Um, Dan did end up suing the police department, but his case was dismissed and he did not win the lawsuit, unfortunately. Now, as far as the boys who were with Jacob that night, Trevor says that he feels even worse because after Jacob's mom told them no, he decided to turn around and call his dad and get permission from his dad. So he's always felt extremely guilty about that. The whole situation is just really sad and heartbreaking. I don't think there's anything these young boys could have done. They could have never even imagined this. Cause like I said, I was around their age, a little bit younger. Being kidnapped, walking a Tom Thumb is the last thing that you think when you're eight, nine, 10 years old. And this was the norm back then. That's what kids do. Like we walked everywhere. You know, we, we, we'd be on one side of the city and we'd be on another side of the city with our bikes. That's just what kids did. There was no cell phones. There was none of that back then. You just had to pray and trust that your kids left home and came back home safely. Now I want to say one last thing. There was a transcript from a jailhouse phone call between Danny Heinrich and his brother. And this was released recently. And in this, he's expressing grief and remorse. He says, I was a monster back then, but I stopped 27 years ago. I haven't had no sexual contact with anybody since that night. He also spoke about his feelings about murdering Jacob. He said, I got home that night, David, and I'm gonna tell you the truth. I cried, I cried, my God, what have I done? I don't know, I'm trying to think of what was wrong. I just don't know what went wrong, what went wrong, what went wrong. Everything went wrong. I don't know what else to think. You know, so that was part of the conversation they recorded of him with his brother. But in my personal opinion, I could care less about his guilt trip. I could care less about him questioning himself as to what went wrong. The only thing that went wrong is that you're a sicko and you killed an innocent child. That That's the only thing to me that went wrong. So the whole situation is very sad. You know, unfortunately the family didn't get quote unquote justice, but at least they got a chance to find out after 27 years what happened to their precious son. So on that note, I thank you guys so much for taking time out to listen to this true crime case concerning Jacob Weatherling. If you guys want me to hit on any other true crime topics, feel free to contact me. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Make sure you guys like the video. Feel free to share the video. And once again, thank you for tuning in to True Crime Tea Time. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.